Shout out to the supporters of Tupac was lyrical. Normally I wouldn't do this because I always tell people you can't compare any rapper to Tupac. Specifically, Biggie and Tupac shouldn't even be in comparison because there was never really a hip hop feud. It was a matter of, it was personal reasons, more or less the things that happened with them two. But when I'm constantly being bombarded on my channel about Biggie was better, Biggie had the better flow, Biggie had the better lyrics, Biggie had this, Biggie had that, and people always saying things like Tupac was kindergarten, basic, Tupac was a poet, you know, Biggie was the supreme lyricist. Like, it's so many things. It's so many things that I encounter on this channel in the social media world of where they're always putting Biggie above Tupac for these for certain reasons of Biggie being able to go into the studio and just go into the booth and spit off the head. And a lot of people saying Tupac couldn't do that. So what I want to do is display a few things that shouldn't tarnish Biggie's legacy. Because let me say this, Biggie is a great MC. He's a dope MC. I fuck with Biggie music. I can't say I don't. So right here, we're going to start this off with Charlie Baltimore from an interview with Art of the Dialogue expressing that she's seen Biggie writing his rhymes. Initially, when he was working on the album, is around the same time we had the car accident. So he wrote a lot the, that album was not supposed to be a double album it was only supposed to be a regular album he wound up writing the second half of the album most of it while he was in the hospital because he had nothing else to do so you heard what charlie baltimore just said was that you know it was a predicament it was a situation circumstance biggie was bored in the hospital so she said that biggie wrote the second half of his album so that would for those who probably wasn't there like Charlie Baltimore was personally to see that, to witness that. So when Biggie goes into the booth to do what he did for life after death, people are witnessing probably Biggie going off memory and just thinking this is flowing from the head. In actuality, Biggie wrote these rhymes down and memorized them. And there's nothing wrong with that, people. There's nothing wrong with that. I do that. There's many other people. There's a lot of artists who do that. But it's just this narrative of people saying that Biggie just went into the booth and Rain Man basically just came off the head, off the dome. Right here, we're going to go into this next clip of Busy Bone expressing that Biggie took the Bone Thugs and Harmony beat home. Okay, so he sat there and actually practiced the flow. Oh, yeah, like, he took it back home, he marinated with it, and he made a hit. You know, it's a difference in, you know, it, it's, he was a musician, man. Yeah. And he wanted the best product, the best material that he could. And that's what he wanted, and that's what he gave us. It was a hell of a verse. So as you see, Busy Bone just expressed that Biggie took the beat. Now, we don't know for what length of time did Biggie have that. But I also have to assume that Biggie practiced their flow and he wrote down his rhymes so he can get a feel, get a vibe and get a flow of what Bone Thugs and Harmony were presenting in hip hop. Now, I just want to read something real briefly. This is from Clark Kent when he was talking about how Jay-Z and Biggie Smalls linked up to create the classic record, Brooklyn's Finest. Jay-Z played Big a few tracks off Reasonable Doubt that he had already recorded. Big loved the joints, and he agreed to do a feature. Jay sat with the instrumental for five minutes, then went back into the booth and recorded new verses, incorporating lines to fit his new accomplice. Biggie was equally impressed and frightened at this sight, asking Clark Kent, what the fuck did he just do? It was then that Biggie decided he wasn't ready to lay down his verse yet. He also wasn't an immediate fan of the back and forth cypher style Jay-Z envisioned. Biggie took a copy of the unfinished record home, returning a few months later to lay down his verses. Now, I just wanted to say that. So this right here also adds on to the mythological of Biggie just going right into the studio and Rain Man and his verses, whereas it also took Biggie some time to create what he created with Jay-Z. If anything that I got out this story is Jay-Z sat with the song for a few minutes, 
went into the booth and had some new verses. Whereas Biggie was highly impressed and frightened. This is what the article says of what Jay-Z just presented. Biggie didn't really see anything like that. So Biggie took the beat home and he had it for three months, then came back and he was ready. But that also just goes to, I'm only saying that because a lot of people feel that Biggie just goes into the booth and does what he does. Maybe on certain songs he did, but I'm just giving you examples. There were times where Biggie did write and there was times where he took a length of time just to write a verse or a couple of verses. And there's nothing wrong with that. Rakim, who changed the game in hip hop, he stated that sometimes it might take him a day, a week, or even a month to do a song. There's nothing wrong with that. It took Nas three tries and six months to create the classic disc record, Ether. There's nothing wrong with that. You're probably wondering why this is important or even necessary. And I will explain that shortly. This right here is a clip of Biggie and Tupac sitting at a table. Spike Lee is present. A couple other people is present. But anyway, Biggie asked Pac, was he ready? You want to start it off? Yeah, I'm scared to do some freestyle. I'm scared to do some freestyle. Flow. I'm too high and I might go off tempo. But now I'm back to let these niggas know just how deep my game run to apocalypse. Don't sleep. I keep a motherfucking Glock in my car. If I'm holding in the club, I gotta be the fucking star. So everybody wanna smile and raise their hands. I got a razor in case I gotta do a next man. Cause you know how niggas be. They wanna see if Pac is real or is he like that nigga in the movie. I guess I gotta prove my point. Slicing motherfuckers now I'm doing the joint. I got my nigga B. I to the G beside me. Yeah. Bitches on my dick, you know the hoes wanna rob me. And my other homies out here like Spike Lee. They got the camera on the nigga, guess they like me. But now I'm about to pass this motherfucker on cause this Tango Ray is getting hell strong. So as you just seen, Tupac spit an actual freestyle. That was you could tell it was a freestyle because Tupac mentioned everything that was presently in front of him at that time. He mentioned a razor. He mentioned the drink Tanga Ray. He mentioned Spike Lee. And he also mentioned Biggie to the side of him. Now, what Biggie did, he allowed Tupac to go first. In my opinion, the rapper that's already on should have made that choice. Like, yo, do your thing, Biggie, and allow Biggie to go first. But Tupac seemed like he wasn't going to entertain it he was like man i'm scared to get the freestyle flow then he just went into it and got open and then he passed the mic to biggie and then biggie does his quote unquote freestyle let's listen to it money holes and clothes blood smoke coming out the nose is all a nigga knows flipping on foes putting tags on toes watching the stash grow clocking the cash flow the neighborhood grave digger getting paid so much all the bitches want to see a nigga i guess they figure i'm paid i want to get laid or since i got loot i want to knock boots huh. i'd rather beat my dick than trick and if she don't suck then we don't fuck huh. i'd rather make a buck drive a fat ass truck grab the nine two clips and run them up yes flex after two or three vexes i wreck shit what the fuck you expected a fly guy well fuck it i'm a high guy from bed stop putting the swelling on your eye your nose even when i choke you you stop breathing when police come i'm leaving you're probably wondering why i said quote unquote freestyle i said quote unquote freestyle because that verse was written it wasn't a freestyle and in my era, a freestyle meant off the dome right then and there. In my era, if somebody is in a cypher and everybody's freestyling off the dome, you're supposed to do the same thing. You're not supposed to bring any written verses into that type of cypher. You're not, unless everybody decides to choose to do written verses. Now, so just say the person that can freestyle very well he never had no he never had written rhymes so therefore it had to be two and it had to be two different kind of ciphers now if you're going to say that somebody is a great you're going to say somebody is a great mc then that great mc must be able to display that they can freestyle i personally haven't seen biggie freestyle i haven't seen no videos of Biggie freestyling. I've seen videos of Biggie 
battling, but I don't know if that's a freestyle. For all I know, it could be pre-written. So this is actually what Biggie spit. So as you can see, that wasn't a freestyle. It wasn't off the dome. Now, nowadays, if you spit a written, you know, some people will say that's a freestyle. But from my era, from what I understand, the freestyle meant off the dome. But somehow the rules of engagement change. But where I come from, if somebody says spit a freestyle, that means you spit something off the dome. Off the dome. That's important. Now you come to somebody and they just be like, yo, spit me, yo, spit something. Then you can do that. So if the first person goes before you and they spit a freestyle without any slip ups and it sounds better than you're written, then come on, man. That's one reason why I say Tupac was better than Biggie. Another reason why I say Tupac was better than Biggie is because of this. What was it about Pac's, Pac in the studio that was just a little different than everybody else? He was a one hit a quitter. He, um, <laughs> really? he got in the studio and he, he was he was quick with it. He, one verse, uh, add a couple of dubs and he was done. So, so he his was work a, ethic was crazy. He wasn't punching in, punching out. He was just one no, verse. he was serious about his business. Yeah, he was straight, straight through. Okay, Busy Bone just said Tupac was a one hitter or quitter. Scarface said that. E40 said that. Too short. In fact, Scarface said Tupac got upset because he was still writing his verses. And they're talking about the song Smile. And if you listen to those two verses by Tupac, he wrote those verses in 20 minutes. And you listen to how relatable it is, how lyrical it is. Lyrical. Because Tupac was lyrical. You listen to how lyrical it is. It's a lyrical masterpiece what Tupac wrote in 20 minutes. Now you got people like Snoop Dogg as well. Too Short, E-40. You got plenty of rappers who said Tupac would do songs in like 15, 20 minutes. Now this is not me saying that. This is them saying that. They, it can't be an exaggeration if everybody is saying like, yo, 10 to 20 minutes, 15 at the most, Tupac would be done with his verses and move on. That right there is incredible. Because why is it incredible? Because of the lyrics that he wrote. So imagine if Tupac took his time like Biggie did when he took the Bone Thugs and Harmony beat home to write that one verse. When he took the Brooklyn's Finest beat home to write those verses to do the back and forth style with Jay-Z. Just imagine if Tupac took his time. The verses would have been even, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to assume that the verses would have been more incredible. So just for that simple fact that Tupac was able to go into the booth or sit right there, you play him a beat and he's writing, he's writing. It's coming out like water. And then he goes right into the booth and spit it like it was a memorized piece, spit it with so much passion. Spit the bars like it was the last day of his life. This is another reason why I say Tupac was better than Biggie, especially based on content. And we're only coming from a hip hop level. Now, let me also add this. Listen to party and bullshit. Listen to his style. He changed from that to Big Pop. Yep. Because of me. He had my album, Me Against the World, was the second one. He had the first one. I changed everything because Ready to Die came out and it sounded like my album. Mm -hmm. All my album was about, you know, dealing with death. Mm -hmm. And then he came out Ready to Die and I had to switch it. Biggie had just took my shit. So, I have to say this. Tupac said that 
Biggie's Ready to Die album sounded like his first album, Me Against the World, the one he scrapped. So Tupac was like, I got to do it over, basically. And Me Against the World and Ready to Die were both recorded in the time period of 1993 to 1994. So if Tupac scrapped his whole first album and then he came with Me Against the World that we all know and love, and respect and many agree that me against the world is arguably Tupac's greatest work. And this is Tupac many, or dare I say Tupac at his lyrical peak because he kept evolving lyrically with each album. And if you don't believe me, go back and listen to Tupaculous now, strictly for my niggas, me against the world, all lies on me, and then Machiavelli, and you see how Tupac evolved with each album. And this was like year after year after year. For instance, the, way, the reason why I say year after year is because when he created Strictly For My Niggas, he recorded that in 1992. It wasn't released until 1993. Whereas just a year before that, he had created Tupaculous Now. So when he does Strictly For My Niggas and it's released in 1993, he begins working on Me Against The World in 1993 all the way up until 1994. And then he hears Biggie's album and he said it sounds similar to the style and content that he had. And why wouldn't it sound similar to what he had if Biggie was down, if Tupac thought Biggie was down with Thug Life at that time? I told him that. I told you know, him that. I trained. He was supposed to be. He was supposed to be Thug Life. Okay. All while he was coming up, I used to let him come on stage with me. He was screaming Thug Life. Hey, cause I he was like, I hate Stadium. Brooklyn. I hate me. I'm out with them niggas puppy cheating me. Woo woo woo. All of a sudden, he blew up, and he wasn't saying Thug Life. So why wouldn't Biggie be kind of influenced or inspired by what Tupac was presenting? So much so that the verse that you heard Biggie spit with Tupac at the table. His flows, cadence, style sounds similar to this verse by Tupac right here. My mouth's bird goes boom, give me room. Can I catch it talking quicker than the Vic that's trying to keep him getting blasted? I had enough, I put a head up on them blasted. Boop, yeah, I'll turn his bins into a casket. Not after me, all on the niggas nuts. Time to see who's the G with the bigger bucks. Buck, buck, big up the living reckless. Niggas with a death wish, stepping with a tech and the reckless. Huh, this shit is hyper. Shoot him with him right and representing him, striking like a viper. Uh, I got my mom made up. I got my nine. Ring the alarm, a strong arm, what's mine? Some niggas need to feel me with a passion. I'm old fashioned. Run up on me, nigga, and get blasted. So it just saying it sounds similar. I'm not saying Biggie is biting or whatever the case may be. I'm just saying when y'all together, y'all crew, y'all there's gonna be similarities in style and content and things of that nature so what tupac did with the me against the world album i feel out of respect i don't feel it was out of jealousy or competition because tupac never looked at these rappers as competition which also leads me to say why i say you can't compare rappers to tupac because he wasn't in no competition but when people want to bombard me and keep saying that Biggie is better and I keep coming across posts that are saying Biggie is better, it's all opinionated. I feel I must share my reasons on why Tupac was better than Biggie. One more thing I must add. We all know that Tupac was born in New York, the East Coast. And we all know that Tupac moved around. And we all know that Tupac got his fame and recognition on the West Coast. A lot of New Yorkers probably heard about Tupac first through the movie Juice. I knew about Tupac before the movie Juice because of the song Trap. Not even realizing that this was the brother that was in the song with Digital Underground, same song. I had no idea at that time. But when I first heard Trap, that was like, a world premiere that was a debut for me and then when the movie juice came out then i was just like oh shit that's that dude that created that song trap i'm from new york so when i heard two populace now content wise i thought it was brilliant i thought it was dope i also thought tupac and ron production wise it wasn't nothing i was used to coming from new york i was really into that boom bap i was really into those different kind of beats especially in 1991 
Whereas you have producers like Molly Mar, you have producers like Pete Rock, you had DJ Premier at the time, you had Diamond D, Lord Finesse. There was, you had Hitman Howie T, Herbie Lovebug. There was there was a lot of producers in New York that I was riding with, like even Large Professor, which uh, who debuted Nas on his main source album. So I was really into those East Coast beats, but I also had an ear for raps and rhymes and content. And Tupac presented that on Tupac Illis Now. When he came out with his second album, Strictly For My Niggas, it was better than his first album. Production wise, the content was still the same, more heavier, you know what I mean? More revolutionary. And I rocked with him. By the time he made Me Against the World, it was a complete album. It was a complete album. Dope beats everything. Tupac had finally come to the peak of this is how you make a, a, a album that appeals for both coasts, let's say, and, and also the South. Whereas Biggie being in New York all the time, New York, you're dealing with competition out the ass. Biggie had to deal with the Wu-Tang. Biggie had to deal with Nas, Kooji Rap, KRS-One. Whoever was rapping at that time, when Biggie was rapping at that time, it was competition. And not only lyrically, you had to be dope, but the music had to be dope. So the producers was in competition with the other producers. Everything had to be dope. Whereas, in my opinion... I don't think that Tupac really had to deal with competition like that because it wasn't that kind of vibe, really, on the West Coast. You can even see that with N.W.A. They wasn't really in competition. They was just talking about what goes on in their neighborhood, you what goes on in their environment. And they were talking about some party shit. So it wasn't really a, a competitive type of nature as it is in New York and as it is now. It's still like that in New York. It's very competitive. It's always been competitive. Now, if Tupac would have stayed in New York and he was still able to be this accomplished rapper that we know who he is today, and he only got the New York culture, New York beats, and he only was catering to a New York audience, then I really think that we will have a different type of Tupac. But being that Tupac was essentially a West Coast rapper and you're comparing an East Coast rapper to Tupac. And when I break down what this East Coast rapper was doing and the narrative that you give him saying that he was the GOAT and he was able to write rhymes and all this other stuff. And then when I present that this West Coast rapper was writing lyrical masterpieces, in my opinion, you might disagree, lyrical masterpieces in 15 to 20 minutes that I got to say like, man, that right there is phenomenal. And that puts him above Biggie, in my opinion, for the things that Tupac was able to do. Not only that, but also doing movies and also doing speeches and also being an activist and also taking on court cases and also saving a brother's life. It's not too many rappers in the game. Let me repeat that. I don't think there was any rapper in the game in Tupac's era that was going through what he was going through, whether good or bad, and still able to give you classic music that we resonate with 28 years later after his death. If that doesn't make Tupac a GOAT or the GOAT, or one of the goats, then I don't know what does. But this is my reasons on why Tupac was better than Biggie. And if I feel the need to make a part two based on your comments, based on what I see, based on how this video do, I will definitely make a part two. But also, if you made it here, let me say this, because there's a lot of haters that come here who think I'm crapping on Biggie, and I'm not. Musically, I think Biggie is a dope MC, one of the dopest, a great artist, great artist. But I gave you my reasons on why I put Tupac over him. 
and it's opinionated. This is just me. It has nothing to do with me trying to discredit Biggie because I'm not. And I wish Tupac and Biggie was still alive. That's a fact. I wish it never would have happened. I wish I wouldn't even have to make a, a, a trifling video like this. I wish it was all love. I wish the hip hop culture would be different. I wish we could see how Biggie and Tupac would flow through this era in 2024 now. But when I'm constantly being bombarded with Tupac hate on my channel and I keep coming and I come across other posts and I read those comments and people just shit on Tupac without doing proper research and without saying that Tupac wasn't a great MC. We're overlooking the fact that Tupac would write rhymes in 20 minutes and he left you classic shit. Then I felt it. I deemed it necessary for me to make this video. We out of here.